One reason we encourage the study of non-covalent interactions is because these are the interactions that hold proteins together. So proteins are synthesized in an uncoiled or random form and then fold up into compact organized structures in which hydrophobic residues are buried in the middle of the protein and hydrophilic residues are on the outside. And this is a theme that we'll see come back later, but in this webcast, hopefully you'll get a feel for why the hydrophobic residues tend to cluster towards the center of the protein while the hydrophilic ones like to face towards water on the outside of the protein. Before we get to that, I wanted to take a minute and talk about the kinds of non-covalent interactions we talk about. Primarily, these are based in some interaction between charges. And we distinguish three kinds of charges that can exist in or on molecules. What you're most used to seeing are the traditional charges that we place in Lewis structures. And these full positive and negative charges can interact with one another to form ionic bonds. You've probably also seen the dipole moment before, and dipole moments refer to the fact that molecules containing different atoms will possess more positive charge on one end than the other. This leads to a polarization of the charge from one end of the molecule to the other, and what's called a dipole moment. We'll see a little later how interactions between dipole moments can bring molecules together and hold them together via an intramolecular force. And then finally, one you may not have encountered before, or maybe it's been a while, is the induced dipole moment. And induced dipole moments have to do with the fact that in a molecule, the distribution of electrons is constantly changing. And so at a particular instant in time, the electron density may be more on one side than the other. Even for molecules for which we wouldn't expect a dipole overall, such as ethane, we still would expect an induced dipole moment to exist at a particular instant in time because the electron density distribution is rarely symmetrical. Induced dipoles depend primarily on the polarizability of the molecule. This is a function of the size of the molecule and the size of the atoms within it, and you should note that larger molecules tend to be more polarizable and exhibit greater induced dipole forces. An analogy that's often made in this context for large molecules is pillows, and for small molecules as rocks or small hard objects. The shape of small hard objects is much harder to alter than, say, a pillow. And similarly, smaller molecules are harder to polarize than larger molecules. Thinking of all the possible combinations of charges, induced dipoles, and dipoles, we can imagine a variety of non-covalent interactions that could possibly exist. Charge-charge interactions you're probably very familiar with, as being simply ionic bonds, and these can occur between groups such as an ammonium group and a carboxylate group, and you see this often in enzymes, for instance. This is often called a salt bridge. Charge dipole interactions can also occur and orient molecules based on the position of a charge. Dipole-dipole interactions are common, for instance in water, where aligning the dipoles leads to a proximity between the positive end of one dipole and the negative end of the other. Charge-induced dipole interactions are between charges and the random induced dipoles present in molecules like toluene. Here in this picture of toluene, you can see that we've arbitrarily polarized the molecule so that its negative charge is polarized to the left and its positive charge to the right. And you can see that the negative end of the dipole interacts with the positive ammonium group. Finally, dipole-induced dipole and induced dipole-induced dipole or dispersion forces are the last two in this table and represent the interaction of induced dipoles with other dipoles. What you can see as we move down this table is that the energy of the interactions decreases as we go down, being inversely proportional to some power of the distance between the two groups. Dispersion forces are the weakest of them all because induced dipoles tend to be the weakest dipoles present in molecules. Here's a graphical representation of this idea with a table that shows you the distance dependence of the force as a function of the charges involved. So we have full charges, dipoles, and induced dipoles in this table. And what you can see from the graphs is that the strongest interactions will be those involving 1 over r. 1 over r squared will be slightly weaker, and 1 over r cubed slightly weaker as we move away from a distance of 1.0 between the two groups.